Shafa. Hi guys, um, we about to start workshop. Uh, the topic for today is uh, practical ZK snacks constructing for Ethereum and using Russ Bellman and the gadget library by Alexander Vlasov, uh, who is a co-founder of the Meta, a scaling solution for Ethereum with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, this workshop will last approximately one hour. We will have 40 minutes lecture, 20 minutes QA. This is a guideline. Um, you will have to uh, ask your questions through chat. There is a button underneath. If you didn't never use Zoom before, there is a chat. Please send message to everyone. Make sure that message to everyone so everyone can see it. And Alexander will ask, uh, answer your questions. Uh, I, just a reminder, this is at, at CONHACK, a uh, live online workshop moderated by CryptoChicks. And I'm passing it to Alexandra. Let's welcome Alexandra. Uh, okay, hello everyone. I will start sharing the screen, I think, immediately. Uh, yeah, with the, the Visual Studio. Um, okay, I did some preparations yesterday. Uh, what we will do, so this is kind of my cheat sheet. Um, in principle, how we start. Um, this is just a standard Rust project. This is a library. What I did before is I made the cargo file, which is required for every Rust project where you just specify uh, the name of the project, some points, and what are the dependencies. So here we use um, standard dependencies for Rust uh, from Crates website, which allow, would allow us to use um, some hash functions later. Time is not strictly <clears throat> strictly required. I don't use it. Uh, hex can be useful if you debug, but we will not do it today, most likely, if we don't hit any um, stupid errors. And random uh, run library is very convenient. It allows you to just um, make random numbers, random arrays, uh, vectors, and field elements, which we will use. And also, I specified dependencies, which are specific for snarks. Those are our forks from the previous works from Zcash uh, for Bellman uh, Sapling Crypto uh, pairing library, which we extended for Ethereum elliptic curve and finite field functions, which I think we added some convenience with uh, serialization and deserialization of points. Um, so we go to the main source. Um, here we specify uh, two modules. One is a circuit, which I did yesterday, which is complete, even has a test at the end. Uh, this one, the demo we will work right now. And the topic for this demo will be a little bit artificial because, uh, well, I will explain it later. Uh, but even while it's artificial, it will demonstrate how to work with different types of uh, variables, constructions, and abstractions, uh, which are present uh, not even in the Bellman, but in a gadget library, which is called the Sapling Crypto uh, in Rust, uh, due to the historical uh, evolution, because it was forked from original Zcash work and a little bit extended. Uh, so what we will do is we will try to make a confidential account. Uh, confidential account um, is something which is encoded, uh, which encodes your balance and some blinding. So you have the balance inside of this account, which you represent of some bits, and you have the blinding, which you also present as a set of some bits. Uh, then you make a hash. Uh, of it, we will use SHA 256. And this is some value. Because it's hashed, it looks random. And unless you know what's inside, it's very difficult to guess what's inside. Uh, so you definitely own your account because you know what is inside and you can prove that this is the value under this hash. Uh, but as it is, this account is useless, you need to somehow prove that uh, you know what's inside of your account. Uh, you take some portion of the balance and you take it away and supply it to some external entity. And simultaneously, you properly reduce the current balance of your account. Uh, 
So just the basic logic of how you would do any transfer in principle. And this is what we will try to go uh, to make today. We will make the account itself. So we will make uh, a ZK snark, which first will prove that you know what's in your account. Uh, then we'll reduce your current balance of your account properly. So we prove that you did have enough funds and did the proper subtraction. And then we will make some external information for external party, which we will call the UTXO in this case. And basically, which is a Peterson commitment uh, with some value and some blindings. So here, what we will demonstrate is how to work with numbers, how to work with uh, bits inside of the circuit, uh, how to work with a hash function, and how to work with embedded curve, or what else people call the chap chap cur curve. Uh, every operation inside the snark is in some finite field. Uh, in our case, this is in prime order. So for this finite field, you can generate another elliptic curve. And this elliptic curve is usually called the chap chap and it's in Twisted Edwards form for efficiency of computation. So I defined a uh, basic structure. So what's the account witness? This is information about your account, about its current state. So if you hash the blinding bits and volume bits, if you can concatenate them together and hash them, uh, what you will get is your current account state. Kind of like the Merkle tree works. Well, not the best uh, parallel, but still. Um, here, uh, first of all, uh, this is externally supplied information for a snark to make a proof. Uh, so it's also, usually it's called the witness. Uh, and convention, uh, and by construction of the Bellman itself and the gadget library, uh, it's much cleaner um, to define every witness as an optional. So because your circuit must not depend on the witness and because of how the Bellman works internally, uh, you can even make a circuit and test it without supplying anything here. So if I make a vector, which is full of, uh, full of knowns, uh, a rust, um, kind of the equivalent of null, well, this is what is optional is for. Uh, if I make a circuit, I can even test it with supplying nothing in here, just supplying the actually vector of no values. And my circuit should work because the circuit should never depend on a witness. So the best practice here is for every witness, for every information which you supply externally, uh, either it's public information as we will have here or private information it's much better to define it as optional because it will save you and if uh, quite a lot of time. And if you somehow misdefine your circuit, it will crash much earlier if you define it as optionals than if you define it as the value. So here we basically have um, uh, 128 bits for a blinding factor and 128 bits for a value, which we will say later concatenate together and just hash to get the current account state. Uh, the witness for the UTXO, because we will produce a TXO, should include two values. One is just a value. Also, it's optional because it's a witness. And the blinding, which is also optional because it's a witness. Uh, both of those, well, if you make the UTXO, you want to give it to someone, and it's uh, in Peterson commitment form or in a confidential transaction form. Uh, then you just need to somehow tell the other party what is a value and what is a blinding so the other party can use it. Uh, what is a confidential account by itself? Uh, confidential account, it will be a circuit, as we will later define. Uh, it has a set of parameters. One is, uh, so we define it uh, as a template over some engine. Well, and this is just a... Uh, lifetime definition for Rust. It's not that important. You can get away it without it. Uh, so the ChapJap engine is some engine for ZK snarks for which the embedded ChapJap curve is defined. And this 
params are just uh, an just a trait which defines uh, these parameters. So how they, those should be defined. It's not that important. You usually generate them programmatically and it's done for you in a gadget library already. Uh, but those are required for further use in the functions. So the current state. The current state is the current hash of your blinding bits and the value bits. And this is, in principle, the only thing the parties which see from the outside. Uh, so this will be one of our public inputs. Uh, because with this NARC, what you prove is that you take the current state, which is a public input, and it's public because it's public, uh, and you prove that you did proper manipulations in it. Uh, then we have the witnesses. One is for account itself, and one for the UDXO, which we'll make. Um, this part is just for convenience. We will later want to clone the circuit. And because it has a live time limited reference, we just need to uh, to define it ourselves for trivial structures like this, we just derive. Um, and here is where all the work starts. Uh, if you want to make a circuit, you need to implement this circuit trait or, or a protocol in other languages. Uh, for your particular structure. For our case, we implement it for conventional account. So the constraint, uh, what it does is basically we have to synthesize your circuit inside of some constraint system. And along the way, you can either return OK or encounter some error. Uh, first of all, I will mainly copy and paste the code because uh, it's already written, but we will just go into, into, into detail for every line. Uh, okay, let me take, for example, this part and explain it in detail. So uh, this is completely standard Rust language structure, which just will crash your program if you not satisfy some requirements. For example, if you supply the invalid number uh, of bits for a blinding factor and the value into the circuit. Uh, it's not that important that you will see later. In principle, the array lengths which we use will be limited anyway by some other by the next lines of code and our constructions. But this is just a simple way how you can check yourself. So if you can check something easily and do it fast, and so you can crash fast, this is the best option. Uh, then we will go to the first line of code, which actually defines something in the circuit. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, assignment is imported. So we can use this construction. Uh, let's define the variable, which we call the current. And it will basically represent the current account state. Uh, we use uh, sapling crypto allocated num uh, structure which represent uh, just a number on a circuit. Well, it represent a, a represents a variable, which later on will take some value and which will be used for um, uh, as a proving time. But in principle, this is just a one variable with some convenience. And the main convenience of the Rust and the gadget library is this part. As you can define how to calculate the value of this, of this variable in place, and not in a separate function like it's done in, in a libsnart. And this is very convenient and saves you a lot of headache. So what we do here is this function uh, uh, takes two, well, two kind of values. Uh, one is a constraint system. And this is uh, actually a name, namespace in function. So you take your constraint system and you go into the next namespace, which is defined as a, actually as a closure uh, with no parameters inside. So you just return something here. We just return a string. And in Rust, if you don't have um, a semicolon uh, after the string, you actually do kind of, the, you kind of return. Uh, so this is just a statement which will tell, um, we make a new constraint system. Names, namespace actually returns uh, a new constraint system. Uh, just namespaced with additional prefix. Uh, prefixes are convenient for debugging if you at some point get into the point where your circuit doesn't work or not satisfied, you will see which variable is not satisfied. 
And the second parameter of the function is a closure over current uh, environment, which will tell how to calculate the value for this variable at the proving time. And this is an important part. Uh, when we generate the circuit parameters, we should never depend on witness. This part is never evaluated. And this is a second check, which will help you to design the proper circuit. If this part is not evaluated, uh, you cannot depend on it in your circuit and you, either your uh, program which, with which you synthesize the circuit will crash, or if it works, most likely you defined everything properly. So how we calculate the witness for this variable? Uh, well, this is trivial. We just take the current state, which we just defined in here. Uh, this value is option, so it can be nothing. And what we do here, get for an option, uh, it's just an extension of option type, uh, gets you either the value or returns an error. And this error with this uh, uh, question sign macro in Rust will propagate up. And basically what you will get is you will get the return here. Uh, and this, this is a value which will be, so it will be propagated from here to here, and as a macro like this, and basically to the end of the function. Uh, so trivially, we just take the value, which is after the get, we unwrap the optional, but well, either unwrap the optional or get an error. With this uh, question sign macro, we uh, unwrap the result or propagate an error. And with this uh, star mark, or I don't know how it's in English, uh, we just dereference it because uh, get returns a reference. Value is a uh, type of FR, which is the element of the finite field of the group, or uh, which is the same power as the group order uh, of the uh, main group of the curve, which we use. Uh, this is what FR stands for. Um, there are different types of, which usually start with F. Uh, what you will usually work is FR because all their uh, arithmetics inside the circuit is done inside of this field. Uh, it's just so this is a scalar field uh, of the main group for your particular engine and your particular curve. Um, so we just defined a variable which should be on a circuit. So this is the first variable which will be inside of our circuit. Uh, we define how to calculate the value for it later uh, when we will use it at the proving time uh, and we propagate errors. Uh, what we need to do is we just need to make it public. So we make another, well, this is a little bit more um, involved than just making, marking it as an input. It actually makes another variable and constraints it. But it's not that important. You can take the variable which is already defined and make it public with this input eyes. And just the same way, you just put some name, name spacing. So if something happened, you know where it happens. Um, okay, so we have the first variable, the account state, and we marked it as a public input. Now the next step is to somehow show uh, what's inside of this current state. And here we get into the area how to work with the bits. Uh, because every variable inside the circuit can take the value in the field, uh, there is nothing like a bit uh, directly. It's just a variable which is in addition of it constrained to be either one or zero. So when you make the variable like this with this Boolean abstraction, uh, the engine itself does all this work for you. And uh, you just get the variable which is internally constrained to be either one or zero. It will prevent you from doing a mistake and from even the possibility to make um, a circuit which can have the invalid witness at some point. So what we do is we just take the blinding bits which we'll use later. We define the array first. Oh, not an array, a vector. It's, let's use the Rust notations. Um, 
with we expect it to be a number of bit a number of blending bits lengths and here even while we constrained or just asserted that the length should be proper uh, we just go from in a range from zero to uh, number of bits uh, without the inclusion of the uh, upper end and we allocate them one by one. Uh, same way as with a number, we can allocate the bit and the boolean. Uh, this is a subtle difference. Uh, the allocated bit is just a variable. But when you allocate it, let's, let's just mark it actually this way for better visibility. Okay, so this is a part which is about the uh, type which is called the allocated bit. Uh, allocated bit is just a variable, which is when you allocate it, is internally constrained to be either zero or one, which is what you expect from the bit. And allocation function for it takes the constraint system, names, which we use for namespacing. So we namespace this part as everything which will happen here will have the additional prefix, which is allocate the blinding bit number E, which we use here. And the format is basically uh, the macro, which will allow us to make a string. Uh, we use a format macro here and e from here to just make our life easier. We know at, if something happens, we know that it happens in particular bit, for example. Uh, and the second parameter is an option. Uh, for the value of this bit. Because we expect it to be the bit, we expect it to be the boolean from the Rust and optional because each your circuit never depends on the witness. So if, even if you define uh, this option as known, everything will work. So this is the allocated bit. And the same way we just propagate an error at most of the points because this, this function can return an error so we can propagate it. Uh, this part, what is a Boolean? Boolean is just a wrapper. Uh, it has three options. One is, uh, uh, this, one is this Boolean is a bit. So internally it has an, an allocated bit. Another option is that this Boolean is the negation of the allocated bit. Uh, and the third option is that this Boolean is constant. Uh, higher level functions like the hash function inside the circuit are defined over booleans because if you define the booleans this way, uh, at the compiled time, when you synthesize the circuit, well, it's a runtime actually, when you synthesize the circuit, uh, and for example, you take uh, an and boolean function between two booleans, both of those are, for example, true, you can just reduce it to the constant. And for different types of of combinations, you can do this reduction, and this potentially reduces the number of constraints in your circuit. So this is a convenient wrapper, and it's very convenient that you can just define it as a constant. Uh, and if your constant actually doesn't affect anything, uh, it will be stripped away uh, when you synthesize the circuit. As, so we define the bit, which is a boolean, and just push it to our vector. And then we do the same for value bits. Uh, all the same, uh, one problem which can happen, and happens all, uh, quite a lot, if you copy paste your code uh, from one place to another, check that this namespace is unique. Because it, if it's not, uh, at some parts, uh, just depending how you write your tests, uh, you can get an extra error that your namespace is the same as one before. So if you do some copy pasting, uh, check this length. Uh, okay, so we just allocated extra variables. Uh, and now we can use them. So we allocated variables which, which are our these are our private witness. We didn't inputize them. This is our public variable. So we make it public so we can supply it externally uh, at the verification team. And now we can use those. First of all, what we need to do is we need to use these bits 
to actually make another variable which will represent uh, the actual value. Because this is just a bit decomposition of our value, uh, we need to make the value itself. And this is the third confection which is used. It uses a num structure from the numbers uh, subspace. And what you do, this num is basically the linear combination which you can easily extend with, uh, with a pair of bit and some value. So this six line of five, six lines of code as actually how you take the bit decomposition of the variable and you take the coefficient for a lowest bit, uh, which is just one. Uh, you take the linear combination, uh, which will be the value of your variable. And you add to this linear combination uh, the part which will either, which is a multiplication result of the bit itself and the coefficient. Coefficient is constant as just one and later we double, we'll make it two, four, eight, et cetera. So because it's a binary decomposition, so we just need to make consecutive powers of two. Uh, the bit is actual variable on a circuit. Multiply, uh, and uh, when you, so you can multiply them together uh, without any additional constraints because we've worked in a rank one constraint system. And you can add them together. So you can add combinations of uh, variable by coefficient uh, into the linear com uh, combination also for free. So basically this six lines of code, they make one linear combination, which is uh, in the form of one, our initial coefficient is just one, multiplied by the lowest bit of the value. So value bits actually little ending, kind of little ending, a least significant bit first, uh, bit decomposition of some value. So what we do basically take one as a constant multiplied by the lowest bit. Then we add to this combination two, it will be two as the next iteration, multiplied by the next bit and do it for number for uh, all the bits in this vector, which is use the iterator as a construction. Uh, this is how the radix two um, decomposition works. So we just make the bits and make a value which will, which is uh, for which the binary decomposition will be these bits. Uh, so that's it. You made the linear combination. This is just a linear combination. It's not yet a variable. And what you do now is you make a new variable and you allocate it the same way. You calculate the value for this variable as just the value which will be accumulated by this linear combination. Uh, and now this is a part which makes everything clear. And now you just constrained the, and you say that my new variable, which I call the value, should be equal. So we work in rank one constraint system as and enforce as in a form A by B is equal to C. Uh, B in our case as a constant is just one. Uh, it's a, so we virtually don't have any multiplication in the middle. So we say that our value should be equal to this linear combination. And because a linear combination is just a uh, binary decomposition of some form, uh, this value is something which is equal to this, uh, uh, binary, uh, to this uh, linear combination and which basically will have the binary decomposition which corresponds to the same set of bits as here. So this is a way how you can take the binary decomposition of something and transform it into the real value number or just allocated num as a type of value. Uh, okay, I really hope I made it clear. Uh, I hope everyone has some understanding how, uh, okay, how ring one constraint system works and what are the uh, linear combinations in this case. Uh, okay, we allocated the value. Uh, now we can 
actually get to the part where we prove that uh, we know what was under the hash for our confidential account state. Um, so we basically first just merge all the bits. So we first have 128 blending bits and then we have 128 bits for a value. And with just one line of code, we calculate the SHA256 uh, SHA all for this uh, set of bits. Uh, there are no bytes in a circuit, so you always work with bits, but this is okay. Um, there are vari uh, various functions in this namespace. Uh, this one corresponds, for example, uh, completely corresponds to SHA 256 um, if you call it in Ethereum in a smart contract uh, over some uh, byte array, which would be basically the same bits but represented as bytes, combined and represented as bytes. Uh, so we get the hash, and hash is just a vector of some Boolean variables. Uh, so the same way hash is basically the set of bits. Um, now we need to somehow tie this hash, which is uh, just number of bits, to the external input, which we defined here, and which we call the current or the current state of our account. Um, this is done kind of the same way as here how we did with the binary decomposition of the variable, how we made a new variable. Um, so what we do here, so hash is a set of bits. We interpret it as a big endian uh, or most significant bit first, bit decomposition of some variable. Uh, this is a tricky part. The hash here is always 256 bits. The size of the field which we, which we work in is FR and the capacity is a number of bits which you can uh, represent safely. So for example, your number is in principle, uh, the module of the field uh, can be, let's say 255 bits, uh, but it doesn't guarantee that every 255 bit number can be uh, represented inside of this field. So most likely, uh, in most cases, and <laughs> let's say in every case, uh, you can find a number of which the, for which the most significant build will, uh, bit will be one, uh, and you will have other bits, but which will be uh, smaller, uh, which will be larger than the field modulus, so it, it cannot be represented in the field. So this is basically uh, the bit length of the field modulus minus one, which can be always safely represented because it's minus one. So how we interpret this uh, hash, which is bits, uh, as some bit decomposition of some value and let's say hash is in big Indian form. So when you just take this hash and you take the um, solidity function and you cast it to unsigned integer of 256 bits, you will get the same result. This is trivial. Everything in Solidity is represented as big endian. So this is quite trivial. We just reverse it. So now we have the least significant bit first. We truncate it. So we don't take the highest bits because our capacity is limited. And the same way we just do the linear combination. Uh, and so this is a linear combination for a value, uh, which can be, uh, which is uh, made from these bits of the hash. And now we can straight it. We don't need to make another variable because we already know which variable should be equal to this combination. And this variable is our current state. So what we do is we just say, uh, the current state as a number should be equal to some number, which is made from bits of this hash treat it as a binary decomposition of some, uh, of some value uh, in the big Indian form. So this maybe 20 lines of code uh, do all this. Uh, and this, all this reversion and truncation uh, is mainly required because uh, in Ethereum you work with big Indian values. 
Uh, and in this case, if you just take the hash in Solidity, and then you take unsigned integer from this hash, just cast it, uh, and then you use this value as a, and well, then you will need to truncate this value, but we will talk about it later. And if you use this value as a public input uh, to your circuit at the verification on a smart contract, uh, you will not need to do any additional uh, transformations. So this is just the way how you tie something inside to something outside. So the current was a public input, uh, and now we tie something inside of our circuit to our public input. So we tie the current state of the account, which is supplied externally, to some hash function um, for our private inputs, which has a blending bits and the value bits. So this is a part which allows you to have uh, zero knowledge in the start. Not exactly the good parallel, but this ties your private inputs or witness um, to the public inputs. So we just tied this. So now we exposed the state of our confidential account. Uh, so this may be how many lines, let's say you have something like uh, 70 lines of code. They prove uh, that for some externally supplied, supplied uh, state of our account, which we call the current as a public input, we know what's inside. And now we can use what is inside for our next manipulations. Uh, we're almost done. We'll have the question soon. Uh, this is not the most interesting part. I think I will just go quickly over it. Um, now we work with the UTXO. And we do all the same. We just allocate the number and tell how we should uh, uh, calculate the value of this number. Uh, then what we do is we limit the number of bits in this volume. And this is required uh, for, very, for a few reasons, actually. But um, the most important one is uh, we have inside of our confidential account, our balance is represented by 128 bits only. So we never should have the UTX value, which is larger than 128 bits for any reason. We cannot send, well, we cannot logically send a larger value. So we just additionally constrain this. Uh, this is not the constraint which ensures that you do the uh, subtraction of the balance, balance properly when you take the part uh, and make the UTXO out of it. Uh, but it's just additional logical check. Um, not strictly required, but uh, why would anyone want to send a large value when you even can never have the balance which is this large? Uh, and we decompose this value into the bits for later use. Uh, this is a function which uh, returns you the bit decomposition of some value. Uh, internally, it just calculates it, this bit decomposition and puts additional constraint in the same form as we did here. So here we pack the pack some bits into one value. Um, here we do the opposite. We uh, make the bit decomposition of some value and internally constrain that uh, if we pack everything back together, it should be the same. Uh, into bits LE. Uh, from little Indian or uh, uh, least significant bit first. Uh, so in this vector, what you will have, uh, sorry, uh, in this vector, uh, the zero element, so the first element of this vector will be the bit which is the uh, least significant bit. Uh, and the same way we do it for the blending factor, uh, we allocate it. Uh, all the same way. Um, and now we get to some interesting part. 
Uh, the same way we just uh, make beats from the blinding factor. The same way. Um, so now uh, we get to the point where we need to work with the Peterson commitment, which will be our UTXO and which will be exposed to external observers. And for all this, there are already functions in such a gadget library. Um, you can actually work with arbitrary point multiplication, uh, but this one is uh, much more efficient. So you get, uh, it's called the fixed base multiplication. And fixed base uh, comes from the point that uh, there is some point on the curve which is treated as a generator or as a fixed base for multiplication. Uh, and you just you multiply this point by some scalar. And this scalar should be represented uh, as a, okay, let's look at the signature. Uh, you, see, you see the by uh, parameter should be a slice of the Boolean variables. So that's why we needed the bit decomposition of the uh, value and the blinding factor. So with this five place of code, what you do is you name space as usual. Uh, you take some, uh, well, well, it's actually the enum, but inside of it is just um, a small number. Um, you take some generator, which was uh, generated for you uh, at the setup time, and this is what are those parameters are for. Uh, these parameters are instantiated externally when you start to make a circuit. Uh, and they define this, you know, the embedded curve parameters, the set of generators for this embedded curve, and some additional precomputations, which are later used. So with this part, you just say that I want to have take one of the fixed points of this curve on this curve, and this fixed point corresponds to the, this uh, enum and to a point which is called the uh, value commitment uh, for value. So this is just some way to enumerate the points. You multiply it by the UTXO value, which you had above as a bit decomposition, and you supply parameters to tell this function of what curve, par curve parameters to use. And all this is synthesized in a circuit, and you get the point, which is um, a representation of of a point on the embedded curve in your constraint system. So we did the uh, multiplication for a value. We did the multiplication for a blinding factor. Uh, all the same way, but use another uh, different uh, generator. And now we make the commitment standard, standard Peterson commitment. So we take the uh, point for a value and point for a blinding and we just add them together. So for point, you can add another one, uh, same way, uh, inside of uh, some namespacing. Uh, so we add value point with a blinding factor or blinding point as in these notations, and as usual, supply some parameters. Uh, and now we make this part also public. So we inputize this commitment, so e, uh, x and y coordinates of this point will be a part of our public inputs. Uh, the circuit is incomplete because, uh, for example, um, oh, well, it's actually complete. It's not logically complete. And now we need to do the final part. We'll just don't have time to go into much more details uh, today. Um, here, okay, let's, let's finish here first. Uh, so here, uh, this is the part for which we actually started all the circuit. We need to properly reduce the balance of our current account. And so what we do here is we make a new variable as usual our remaining value or what will happen after we take the balance and 
subtract the UTXO value out of it. And so basically all the same way. Uh, we take the value of one variable, we take the value of another variable, we subtract uh, one from another and we return it. So it's just how we will calculate the witness. But this is a witness only, it does nothing for a circuit. And now we need to enforce it. Uh, so first enforcement will be that we actually do the subtraction. Uh, so we make a constraint in form that our remaining value multiplied by one, this is the same always in a form A multiplied by B minus, uh, is equal to C, uh, should be equal to the linear combination of a value minus the UTXO value. So basically this is how we enforce the subtraction. Uh, but the most crucial part is this four lines. Uh, because we work in a finite field and there the subtraction with overflow is completely valid and allowed. So in principle, I would have the value of one, subtract the value of two, uh, and all this will work because we're in a finite field. Uh, now I need to pull the trick. I need to, be, to make sure that I, if I don't overflow, uh, my reminder uh, will never exceed the original bit width uh, of the value. So for example, if I take uh, one 128 bit value and subtract another smaller 128 bit value, what I will get at the end will have the number of uh, significant bits, which is 120, uh, 128 or smaller. If I would overflow in a finite field, and in our case, a finite field is much larger. It's 100, uh, it's 254 bits for our case. If I would overflow, I would definitely have the bits uh, in positions, for example, 124, 3, 2, et cetera, which are non-zero. Uh, so what I can easily do is I can just constrain that those are zero. And this is this function limit number of bits, what it does. Uh, it just constrains that the higher bits for this value are all zeros. So it basically ensures that I didn't overflow when I did the subtraction. Uh, so I see that we, uh, it was something like 40 minutes for um, presentation, I already went past of, past of it. Uh, I will stop the screen share for now and we'll check the chat. You should, uh, if you have any questions. Um, this material, first of all, this material will be available. I will just commit and push. Uh, and the most interesting part was actually a test. Because this is how you write the tests for a circuit and it demonstrates um, different types of constraint systems uh, or just abstractions over constraint systems and how to make a witness for a circuit. For example, uh, I will go very quickly over it. There is what's called a test constraint system. It has nothing to do with the SNARK actually. It's just the constraint system which operates at the level of rank one constraint system and does all these evaluations uh, uh, like, like this one immediately when you define it. So this constraint system will allow you to uh, print value of this variable somewhere here uh, and you will get something out of it because it will be evaluated in place. Uh, it's very convenient when you test the circuit. But for this constraint system, uh, you need your circuit to actually contain a witness. So, but this has some convenient instruments. For example, you can find unconstrained variables and it happens when you design a circuit. So this is a convenience function which allows you to find all those variables and allows you quickly to check if the constraint system is satisfied. If the constraint system is satisfied and all your variables are constrained, you will be able to make the valid proof for it. If not, you will not. Um, and there is another option actually. 
for zero is a function in Bellman, which just allows you to generate random parameters for a circuit. Uh, and for this part, for random parameters for a circuit. So basically this is makes use a common reference string and the verification key. This function does not require you to have any witness at all. So this is how you would potentially define the circuit by supplying no witness. So there are knowns for every optional variable which is defined. Uh, so this is the same check as I told at the beginning. It allows you to check that your circuit that never depends on the witness. So this function never evaluates a witness because circuit doesn't depend on it. Uh, and it's also another type of check which you can run. Oh, like not the check, you should always design the circuit properly. Uh, but when you generate random parameters, uh, this is a trusted setup actually, kind of trusted, run, run by a local PC. And I tr trust myself that I deleted all the entropy. Um, this is a part which actually does a trusted setup. And when you run it somewhere in your code, uh, you should supply the witness, which is all empty. And the rest of it is trivial as just how you make the prepared verification key, which is just a wrapper over verification key, which does some precomputations, and how you supply the public inputs, how you verify the proof. Not that interesting. It doesn't affect the logic of how you design the circuit, uh, but it just demonstrates how to mix tests. Um, how to stop the screen share. It's uh, at the top oh, of the screen, top of the screen. Uh, okay, uh, I will, I want to check the chat actually. There is, oh, Felix, ah, okay. Uh, to impotize the blind version of the subtract the balance before, uh, of the subtracted balance, uh, no, well, the circuit is incomplete. Uh, actually, what ideally, uh, we just don't have time for it. And so I, I made this circuit for myself yesterday to roughly relate how much time it would take for me to explain. Uh, as you see here, I actually defined new blinding bits. And so what I would, want to do at the end is as a final step, but we just don't have time for it. I would take this remaining value. Uh, okay, let me get back to, uh, to the demonstration. Uh, okay, answering the question for Felix from the chat. Um, so I did define the new blinding bits for account witness. And what I would ideally do to complete the circuit, if you would want to use it and have some logical result out of it. You would take this remaining value, you would beat decompose it, uh, just cut uh, the top bits, so you have 128 uh, least significant bits. Uh, then you would take this new blinding factor, uh, new blinding bits for account state, this one. Uh, then you would hash it together, uh, then you would truncate truncate the hash the same way as we do here. And you would pack it into the new variable and you would make this variable public. Uh, in this way, uh, your circuit would have uh, four public inputs. Uh, now we have just three, actually. Uh, the first public input would be the current state of the account. The second public input would be the new state of the account. Uh, and third and fourth, uh, will be actually X and Y coordinates uh, for a point, which is a Peterson commitment, uh, and which will be UDU takes a value. So then the circuit will be complete. Uh, it will have the logical completeness. Uh, and this is a value which you would want to inputize. Uh, I hope I did answer your question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the valid balance, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, well, like, okay. Uh, let's say you have, uh, uh, well, 
in this case, uh, you, what you will have, what you would have this uh, uh, modulus uh, minus uh, two in hundred twenty-eight, which will be much larger when uh, two in uh, one in the power of one hundred twenty-eight. Uh, I think I will just try to. Um, Uh, to type it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, with roughly is just a rough equivalent. No, you will you will not <laughs> overflow many times this way. Well, uh, at the moment, uh, there are more or less uh, three tools, set, four tool sets, which can be recommended. Uh, they work on different levels. Uh, one is um, a regional LibSnark, and there is a wrapper around it called the ETH Snarks. It uses the LibSnark plus the Python code around it. I never actually did use it. I worked with LibSnark only before. Uh, LibSnark is written in C, and in my just personal opinion and preference, uh, C is much less readable uh, than Rust in principle. Um, second, the LibSnark is how it's made, uh, and this is a part which troubles me, troubled me most when I designed the circuits in LibSnark. As you cannot define something like this, uh, the screen share still works. Uh, something like the closure, which will calculate you the witness for this variable right in place. Uh, this is a big disadvantage. In LibSnark, you first have to define constraints, and then you have to define the function which calculates the value of all these uh, variables for you. And it's just much less readable code. Uh, I didn't use the ETH snarks, maybe the Python wrapper around it adds um, some degree of convenience, but I just don't know. A second one is this uh, combination of Rust, Bellman, uh, and the gadget library. Uh, when I switched to it, I immediately liked it, even while uh, for Rust itself, it's kind of high bar, a high entry bar, uh, due to the language structure such as uh, borrowing. But if you just des uh, design the circuit, you most likely will not care about it. There is a little part in here which actually uh, is affected by this uh, uh, ownership uh, mo uh, model of the Rust itself. A third one is Aiden and the Circum. Uh, those are in JavaScript, so it's a much lower entry bar uh, at the price of the performance. So if your circuit is small, you could try, definitely. Uh, we person, uh, I personally work, and we, work, as a matter, we work with a circuit of the largest possible size. So we, performance is crucial. Um, so we use a Bellman, and it's highly actually parallelized for modern uh, processors. So you can calculate your proof or generate your parameters with many threads, utilizing the processor power properly. And the fourth option is uh, Socrates, which is uh, a custom language, a uh, custom programming language or DSL, uh, which is made to design circuits. Um, I think this is the easiest solution. They're actually very easy to work with and to start. Uh, at the moment, they are using the LibSnark to actually generate the proofs. So you define your circuit, uh, in a custom language, but under the hood, when you generate the proof, they use the LibSnark. Uh, I heard at some point that they want to switch to Bellman uh, to have everything in Rust, and just Bellman is more performant. Uh, but if you would want to start, I would say uh, the easiest solution is uh, Socrates. Uh, next one, you can try either Aiden 
or um, Bellman in a Rust. Uh, if you want to go all the way down to C, you can try the LibSnark itself. I think it's a point when we will try to, uh, when you will want to try the LibSnark, you will not need any more help at this point. Uh, Uh, Felix, I think I didn't get your questions quite clearly. Uh, want to put our own, uh, well, I mean, let's say first of all, the hash function returns the set of bits and those are bits because they were all the way inside, internally constrained. I mean, uh, the hash functions take bits as input and work uh, with logical uh, shifts uh, and uh, and XOR functions inside of it. So the output of the hash function is guaranteed to be uh, the bit decomposition. Oh, how do you know? Uh, this is, um, yeah, uh, the tricky part. This is up to the designer of the gadgets. I think the shown ball was a huge professional, is a huge professional. And if his function uh, is a part of which, uh, not, not every function here is written by us, we use a lot of his work. Uh, if this function returns you a Boolean. Oh, read, okay. Uh, so the question from Felix was is, how do we know uh, if the logic, for example, for bits, uh, was internally constrained if we call some function. Uh, so the answer here is two-sided. One, if you use existing functions of the gadget library, like this uh, hash function, uh, those are very designed and their signatures are in a form that if you return here, for example, from a hash function, you get the vector of the Boolean variables. And if you take the vector of Boolean variables, you can be sure that those are actually bits. Uh, you can get it either from function signature or you can go into the gadget library and follow the logic. But the hash function works with the uh, individual bits just because uh, just of how the uh, SHA-256 works. Uh, so here you get the booleans. So I would say follow the function signature if you use the existing gadget library. If you try to make something yourself, uh, you should try to convince yourself first. So if you want to make um, an extension for a gadget library, which for which you implement some function which you believe should return the bits, you definitely should make the signature of the, of the function that it returns the bits, but Else, you have to convince yourself that internally you never break this guarantee. Uh, yeah, I hope I try to answer it. The same way actually is for um, LibSnark. Uh, gadgets here, even while there is no clear indication, very clear indication that these variables are bits, uh, the signatures in the LibSnark also uh, demonstrate you this, that these output variables um, are uh, guaranteed to be uh, bits itself. If you're not sure at some point, for example, just additionally constrain it to be either one or zero, uh, if you have some doubts. Uh, Okay, if there are no more question, questions, yeah, uh, all this material, uh, it will be, uh, it is actually already public at the GitHub, okay. Uh, uh, I will just push all our code in there, even while it's a duplicate. You can check it at the GitHub. I think the link was already posted. Uh, in the worst case, uh, it will be reposted. 
you use this material freely if you want to start. Uh, try to get what's inside of the tests because it uses quite a lot of untrivial functions. How you can tie uh, the normal Rust variables or even uh, field elements uh, with the bit decompositions with uh, byte representations. Uh, how you you take the hash result and you uh, combine it back to the field element. Uh, how, for example, in Solidity, uh, it is done by one line of code, which just casts the uh, byte 32 into an signed integer 256. Here, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, so I hope the um, uh, test part will answer a lot of your questions. Uh, but yeah, good luck with designing the snarks. This is uh, very tricky, but very interesting. And uh, uh, yeah, Elena else asked to do the next announcement right after this. So please don't uh, leave the chat room. I will stop the screen share for now. Hello. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. It was great content. Thank you for sharing it. Um, while, guys, uh, you are thinking about maybe some other questions, even though I think we're pretty much done, I would like to remind you that Edcon Hack is open to register, and don't miss it. It's a great opportunity to learn and hack. Register at www.edcon.io at slash hackathon. We will share this information in the chat as well. For those who is following us, I also wanted to remind you that our next workshop will be conducted on February 20th at 5 p.m. at Sydney, Australia time. And the topic will be generalized state channels work and conditional payment design pattern. It will be delivered by Michael Zhu, the core developer of Sela Network. This workshop was brought to you by CryptoChicks and LinkTime. Thank you for joining. And um, we hope to see you next time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have fun. The information is now in the chat, so guys, feel free to uh, check it out.